Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Quincy, Chair of the Ways and Means Committee, and welcome to our regularly scheduled uh, meeting. Um, I'm joined by Council Members uh, Lene Palomasano, Lisa Bender, Blong Yang, and Council Vice President uh, Elizabeth Glidden. Uh, Council Member Andrew Johnson is uh, not going to be with us today as he's home ill, so we wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, we are certainly a quorum of the committee and conduct the city's business here. Um, we have a number of items on our consent agenda, which I'll begin with. Um, there's quite a few items here. It looks like 21 various items. Uh, the first is a series of uh, legal settlements from the uh, city attorney's office, as well as a uh, legal services agreement and waiver of conflict of interest with Fredericks and Byron, and a uh, authorizing the mayor and police chief to sign on to a Supreme Court amicus brief item. Uh, the fourth item is from the city clerk's office. This is the uh, establishing the 2015 Board of Appeal and Equalization, appointing uh, uh, Ted Marinak, Sandy Lesher, and Earl Netwall to the Minneapolis Board of Appeal and Equalization. The uh, fifth item is approving a list of city positions subject to SE, uh, SEI filing requirements. That's a statement of economic interest. The Convention Center brings forward a couple of items. Uh, the, the first one here is appropriate city staff to issue a RFP for the Convention Center and Target Center Consulting Pool. And the Finance Property Services Department is bringing forward three items. One is the uh, Fridley Water Softening Plant Facility Assessment, a uh, Medical Review Bill Services Contract Amendment, and uh, author authorizing a negotiation enter in a contract with Alpha Review Corporation for workers' comp and employment services, medical billing services. Information Technology Department's bringing forth a contract extension uh, for traffic sign management system, as well as amending a contract with Advanced Public Safety for the Minneapolis Police Department citation system. The Police Department is bringing forward an item for the 2015 National Forensic Sciences Improvement Program, and the Community Development Regulatory Services Committee is bringing forward their annual uh, deed uh, cleanup investigation grant program, as well as Metropolitan Council for Livable Communities Tax Base Revitalization Account grant program and the Hennepin County Environmental Response Fund Awards. We'll also have Met Council Livable Communities Demonstration Accounts. And let's see, Health <clears throat> Environment and Community Engagement Committee is bringing forward a contract with Minnesota Department of Health uh, for maternal and child home visiting services. The Transportation and Public Works Committee is bringing forward the Penn, Penn East, and McKinley areas, uh, Girard and Humboldt Avenue Northeast Street resurfacing project, a sale of city-owned land to the Minnesota Sports Facilities uh, Authority, uh, MPCA grant award for commercial waste evaluation, uh, the Hennepin Lindale Corridor Street Reconstruction Project and Design Contract Amendment, the 35W South Storm Tunnel Rehabilitation Cooperative Construction Agreement, and the final item is accepting a low bid with Hydromax USA for an estimated expenditure of uh, $559,871.90 for closed circuit inspection of the city's sanitary sewer system. Are there any questions from committee members on those items? Councilmember Blong, Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of comments with regards to item number 16, if that's okay. Sure, please. Um, on item number 16, um, I went to a community meeting on February the 10th, I believe, uh, with regards to this. And um, I, I think I might have pointed it out at TPW, but um, in case I didn't point it out very clearly, um, at that meeting, our staff uh, may have misquoted the um, amount that I guess the assessments would pay for and the amount that the city would pay for. And, um, you know, the, the ratio that was quoted at that meeting was about, uh, bless you, uh, was 98% um, being paid out of assessments. Uh, and that's not correct. Uh, the actual number is about 75%. And so I wanted to make that clear that um, 
No, with regards to this project, uh, the assessments will cover about $2.4 uh, million of a project that's $3.1 million. And so actually the city is covering um, a good 25% um, of the rest. And I wanted to point that out. I, a couple of things I also wanted to point out with regards to this project is that uh, our city staff worked really hard to figure out some things that um, the residents were complaining about, specifically with regards to the Oliver Avenue North and 37th Avenue North piece where about four or five years ago there was a full reconstruction of that area and so they exempted that or they uh, reduced it as uh, the term was used so that the residents who live you know in and around that area don't have to be assessed for that and the other thing that I wanted to note for folks is that um, with regards to the proposed greenway that could be anywhere from the next five to ten years away uh, what we did with that was that uh, we basically excluded that from the project. And so, you know, I, I think for the folks who live around that area, um, hopefully that was, you know, a little bit of um, some grace for them. But, um, you know, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to point that out just because, you know, I know that every time we do any sorts of uh, reconstruction, uh, resurfacing, residents tend not to be too happy with the assessments. But in this situation, I think our staff did uh, really good work to try to troubleshoot the issues and make it better for people. Good. Thank you very much. Any other comments, questions on those 21 items on our consent agenda? Not seeing any. All those in favor of those items, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Those items uh, carry. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll get to our uh, discussion uh, item, which is actually a quasi-judicial hearing. And so I think we'll begin, I think, with uh, Mr. Lively is going to join us and introduce the topic, and we'll do have a pretty presentation. After this presentation, we'll be conducting the public hearing portion of the uh, of the meeting. Uh, we won't be taking any action today. I just wanted to make sure people understood that, and I'm sure that'll be clarified in uh, Mr. Bradley's presentation. But if Mr. Lively, if you can begin, please. Thank you, Chair Quincy, members of the committee. I'm Matt Lively, Interim Director in the Communications Department. Uh, as you know, last month, the city received an application for a cable franchise from CenturyLink. Uh, Comcast Cable currently has a non-exclusive franchise agreement with Minneapolis which means that other entities can also seek cable franchises within the city. Uh, today's public hearing is one of the steps that's required during the consideration of any new cable franchise. Uh, before the public hearing is open today, in just a minute, Mike Bradley will make a presentation to explain the franchising process. Mike is with the firm Bradley, Hagen & Gullickson, and he's represented the city on cable issues for many years. After today's hearing, we'll continue to accept written comments from the public through this Friday on the application. You will not be taking any vote on the franchise today, as uh, Chair Quincy mentioned, but within the next few weeks, we will be making a recommendation on whether to grant a franchise, and we'll bring that recommendation back to this committee for its consideration. So for now, I'd like to introduce Mike Bradley. Welcome, Mr. Bradley. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members, and thank you, Matt. Um, it is a, a privilege to be in front of you uh, today. Um, as Matt said, my name is Mike Bradley. I am with the law firm of Bradley, Hagen & Gullickson. I've had the privilege of representing the city of Minneapolis for uh, well over a decade now on cable franchising uh, issues. Um, and we are having a fairly unusual hearing today. That is a, a public hearing on a new cable franchise application. I don't think this has happened probably since the late 1970s that a new cable franchise application uh, has had a public hearing. So the purpose of this uh, hearing that we're having today is to hear from CenturyLink and the public on that cable franchise application. And as uh, Matt and the chair uh, mentioned, there'll be no final action uh, taken today. Uh, the purpose of my remarks is to uh, give uh, the council and uh, members of the public a little bit of the background on cable franchising in the city. Um, the events leading up to the uh, submission of an application by CenturyLink for a cable franchise. Uh, then the application process, the public hearing process, and then the process that we will follow uh, post hearing. 
So just very briefly on the, the cable history of, uh, of the city of Minneapolis, and this is very brief. I think I could do several hours of cable franchising history in Minneapolis, but very briefly, um, Comcast is, is the cable, is the franchise cable operator here in the city. And um, that cable franchise gives them the privilege of using the public rights of way throughout the city in order to provide cable services uh, to the residents of the city. It's a very valuable privilege, as you might imagine. Um, uh, in order to provide cable service in the city of Minneapolis or any franchising authority in the country, the uh, cable operator has to have a cable franchise, and that's a requirement under federal law. Uh, and that franchise in the city of Minneapolis allows uh, Comcast to um, generate millions of dollars every year um, uh, from providing that service to residents. Comcast, through its predecessors and interests, have held a cable franchise here in the city. Um, my slide says since 1983, and really 1983 is when they built uh, the cable system here in the city. The franchise was actually initially granted in 1979, and there was litigation that followed that, that grant of the franchise, and uh, ultimately um, uh, the, fran the, uh, the cable system here started to be built in 1983. So some of you that have been around uh, for a while, um, either on the council or in the public, uh, may remember that uh, Northern Cable Vision was our first cable uh, uh, franchised cable operator. Uh, it was then transferred to uh, Rogers, then Paragon, then Time Warner, and then ultimately Comcast um, in 2006. Um, the franchise, it's important to, to remind uh, the public uh, and ourselves that the cable franchise that Comcast holds is non-exclusive, so the city has the uh, authority to um, franchise additional cable operators. Um, the cable franchise with Comcast right now is, is set to expire in, in 2021. As far as competition in cable uh, or in the provision of television services in the city, um, Comcast has had competition from satellite uh, providers like uh, DirecTV and Dish Network, as well as uh, over-the-air broadcasters. Um, and then more recently, over-the-top providers such as Netflix and uh, Amazon. Um, but since 1979, there has been no um, wireline competition here in the city of Minneapolis. Turning then to what's, what is bringing us here today, uh, you'll recall back in the summer of uh, 2014, CenturyLink announced plans to provide uh, one gig uh, internet service um, in, the, in the Twin Cities, particularly the city of Minneapolis. Um, and then in December of 2014, CenturyLink approached city staff and indicated that they were ready to apply for a cable franchise here. Once that happened, um, city staff began following the process that's uh, laid out in Minnesota statute. So it's Minnesota statute section 238.081. Um, the first step in that process is to publish a notice of intent to franchise, which uh, we did in uh, finance and commerce. The state law says that you have to publish notice uh, in a, a paper of general circulation once a week for two successive weeks. Um, and we did that on December 23rd and uh, 30th. State law also requires that you uh, indicate a deadline for submission of, of applications for cable franchises. That uh, deadline has to be 20 days, at least 20 days after the first date of publication. Uh, and that was done. The deadline listed in the, in the notice was January 20th, uh, 2015, which was well past the, uh, the 20 day minimum um, deadline. The city received one application for a cable franchise, and that was from CenturyLink. It was received on January 20th, uh, 2015. It was timely. Um, state law requires a public hearing, uh, and notice of that public hearing in the notice of franchise, uh, notice of intent to franchise. Um, and we notice the uh, the ways and means meeting today as the as the day for the public hearing. Um, in addition to the uh, notice of intent to franchise, once once the city received an application from CenturyLink, um, the city um, followed up with a request for additional information from CenturyLink. Uh, that was done on January 28th, 2015. And CenturyLink responded to that, um, to that request on February 16, uh, 2015. 
And I believe all of those documents uh, were linked to for the public uh, prior to this meeting. There's several application requirements under state law, and I'm, I'm going to go through them, most of them fairly quickly. I'm going to highlight one in particular that I think you know, we'll probably get more testimony on and more questions on as we go through the process. Um, the application needs to have uh, indicate their pl the plans for uh, channel capacity by the new uh, applicant, uh, indicate what channels are going to be provided on the system, um, describe the proposed system design and planned operation of the cable system, uh, and provide the terms and conditions under which particular services to be provided to governmental and educational institutions. The application uh, also is required to have a schedule of proposed rates. And then the middle, um, this middle requirement is the one I, I highlighted and bolded here for you. Um, and really I, I think is kind of the focus of, of some of the uh, comments that you'll hear today. So that requirement is a time schedule for construction of the entire system with a time sequence for wiring the various parts of the area requested to be served uh, in the request for proposals. That In the request for proposals is really uh, old language. There's no longer a requirement to do a request for proposals for cable franchises. It used to be over 10 years ago, um, but in the application. Um, so I, I highlighted that because there's a requirement in state law that requires all initial cable franchises uh, to, to indicate how the cable system is going to be built over a period of time. And that statute, which is 238.084 subdivision 1M, um, requires that uh, all, cable fr all cable franchises in the state of Minnesota have language that say that a, a cable system will be built out uh, by 50 plant miles a year, and that the entire system will be complete within five years. Um, it's uh, CenturyLink's position, uh, and I'll let them explain it more, but I'll just very briefly uh, indicate that it's CenturyLink's position that that language uh, is preempted by federal law, uh, and I suspect that others may uh, have a, another um, interpretation of, of the law, and we'll hear from those uh, parties today. Um, it's not the purpose of this hearing to make decisions on who's right or who's wrong, but to listen to uh, both of those sides. Um, applications also need to have a statement indicating the applicant's qualifications and experience um, operating a cable system to identify which, um, which cities or franchising authorities the, um, the applicant has franchises currently any plans for financing the cable system, um, a statement indicating you know, what its ownership structure is. And then if there was um, any omissions or variations from the application procedures under state law, they have a statement explaining you know, why, why it was that they um, deviated from the requirements. As Chair Quincy, uh, noted this is a quasi-judicial process for reviewing a cable franchise application. Um, so when you're, you're doing cable franchising as a city, um, you'll require documentary uh, evidence in the form of the application and it will allow testimonial evidence, which is what we'll be hearing today at the public hearing. And then ultimately a final decision will be uh, issued by the city. To be upheld, any decision must uh, not be arbitrary, oppressive, unreasonable, fraudulent, under an erroneous theory of law or without any evidence to support it. And I know you're all familiar with your role as, as policymakers in quasi-judicial matters, but um, so the public understands um, what uh, your role is in uh, reviewing this application. Uh, the role of the policymakers is to preside over the cable franchising process as a, uh, a neutral and impartial decision maker uh, to base your decision only on the information uh, that is before you and that is included in the formal record of the proceeding. Um, any um, decisions will be, um, will include factual findings uh, and the reasons that support your decision based on the record. So turning to the uh, 
the public hearing process then today. Um, the committee should accept um, written materials into the record, um, which would be um, currently the franchise application and um, CenturyLink's response to the city's information request. Um, CenturyLink then will, will um, do a presentation on their application. Uh, then the public will be invited to comment on the application as well, and that will include um, the current cable franchised uh, operator Comcast. Um, we're recommending that the uh, record be um, held open or the public hearing be um, uh, held open until Friday, February 27th at five o'clock uh, to allow for written additional written comments by the public. Uh, and those written comments can be directed to the cable officer, um, who is also the communications director, Matt Lively, uh, or the city clerk. Um, on Friday, February 27th, 2015, five o'clock, the public hearing would then be closed. Uh, following the, the, the public hearing, once the, um, once the public hearing is closed, the cable officer will then uh, prepare a written report with a recommendation to the um, committee, as uh, Mr. Lively uh, mentioned. Uh, Ways and Means will receive the, um, re the, the report from the cable officer and then um, recommend action by the city council. And of course, the city council would be the final uh, decision maker ultimately. So uh, with that, I think that's, oh, there's one more slide. We have the record. So the record is gonna contain documentary evidence, testimonial evidence, cable officers report and the city's written de um, decision. The documentary evidence uh, will include the published notice of intent to franchise, the application from CenturyLink, uh, any supplemental filings from CenturyLink uh, and other documents received into the record at the, today at the public hearing uh, or received by the cable officer or uh, city clerk uh, by uh, five o'clock uh, this Friday. Testimonial evidence will be from the public hearing today. Uh, and with that, that's my presentation. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions you might have regarding the process. If there are none, I will uh, turn it over to CenturyLink for their presentation. Let me just um, check with, and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bradley, right. first of all, for doing this uh, work uh, in, in, uh, in issuing the, the request for the application and all of the work that you went to uh, assemble that, especially the additional uh, information that we've requested. Um, I guess I have a question. I think it's from Mr. Ginder for sure. Mr. Bradley. I just want to check on process. If uh, the, the council members had questions, who would we be asking questions of as part of the public hearing or is it staff presentation or would that be part of the public record, the responses to those questions? Mr. Chair, um, my position, you can ask questions either of staff during this public hearing. You can ask it of uh, CenturyLink. Um, any questions you might want to ask at this time would be appropriate and you could direct them to either staff or to CenturyLink. Okay, thank you very much. That just helps me kind of figure out what's doing what. Because uh, I, I know during normal public hearings, we're in an information gathering listening mode, and I assume that's what right. we're gonna be taking on, but it gives us an opportunity to ask uh, questions, and I wanna make sure that was the opportunity. So that's it. I think I, what I'd like to do is to invite uh, CenturyLink uh, to join us uh, for the first portion uh, to officially act I'll open the public hearing and this uh, testimony would be part of the public record, uh, but CenturyLink, you'd be first up if you'd uh, care to join us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll, we'll be um, hearing from uh, Dwayne Ring from CenturyLink first and then uh, Jim Campbell from CenturyLink Very after good. that. I like Mr. Ring's name. I think it's a great name for a phone. It's a good ring to it. Right, it has a good ring to it. Yeah. Good, Very thank good. you. I've never heard that before. Yeah, it's <laughs> first time today, huh? Uh, members of the committee, thank you for inviting us uh, to speak today at the public hearing on franchising, and thanks to the staff for helping us through this process. Uh, my name is Dwayne Ring. I'm the president of the Midwest region for CenturyLink, uh, located right in downtown Minneapolis, in fact, right across the street. Uh, until now, the cable company has had a monopoly on television service in Minneapolis. Uh, today, CenturyLink is here prepared to bring a choice and bring the benefits of competition to Minneapolis. Our service, was called CenturyLink Prism TV, runs off an internet protocol network that serves as a video backbone for higher quality pictures, interactive features, and an IP-based application system. 
the video content travels CenturyLink's managed two-way IP network and arrives at the customer's home, usually via fiber optic cable, sometimes via copper cable. Uh, and it's it and at the home technology, providing more inter interactive TV experiences. Prism TV always has the newest technology because it's continually refreshed and updates automatically. CenturyLink in Minnesota uh, employs approximately 3,000 people with the majority of those jobs located right here in the Twin Cities. More than half of the CenturyLink employees in the Twin Cities are represented by the Communications Workers of America Union. This includes the approximately 200 Prism trained network technicians and an additional 300 network technicians that work on our systems daily. CenturyLink also employs 100 network engineers in the Twin Cities who work in partnership with the network operations team to plan, build, and deploy service. Deploying CenturyLink's Prism TV in Minneapolis also takes experience. I'm here as a 30-year employee of CenturyLink, and I personally led the successful effort to bring Prism Television to CenturyLink's first market 10 years ago in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Last year, I helped lead the PRISM deployment in Omaha, Nebraska, and I will be here to lead this deployment as well. Today, CenturyLink currently offers PRISM television service in 14 markets across the country, including Phoenix, Denver, Colorado Springs, and Las Vegas. Here in the Midwestern region, we have PRISM television in Omaha, Nebraska, Jefferson City in Columbia, Missouri, and La Crosse, Wisconsin. Today, approximately 2.3 million homes across the CenturyLink footprint have access to PRISM. Currently, amongst those 2.3 million homes, we have 3,000, 300,000 rather, customers across the country. Deploying PRISM in the Twin Cities is a significant undertaking for us. It's one that takes a company just like CenturyLink with the viability, the capital, the skills, and the focus to get the job done. CenturyLink is the third largest telecommunications company in the United States. We rank 158th on the Fortune 500 list of top companies in the United States. We provide data, voice, and managed technology services in local, national, and selected international markets throughout our high quality advanced fiber optic network and have multiple data centers throughout the globe. We are also a global leader in technology and cloud infrastructure for business customers. Today, CenturyLink is providing service to more than 80% of the Fortune 500 businesses. As you know, our application, bringing CenturyLink's Prism TV to Minneapolis, is a very significant investment for our company. It's making an, it is a significant investment in the infrastructure and the technology we're making right here in Minneapolis. I'm proud of our ability to make that investment as both a business leader in Minneapolis, but also as a resident of the city myself. I personally look forward to continuing the work that we've built on together with you to expand PRISM in the Minneapolis market and bring choice and competition to your constituents. Based on our application and record set today, we are confident that we have the technological, managerial, and legal qualifications to earn your approval to deploy these services. Joining me here today from CenturyLink is Jim Campbell, the Region Vice President of Regulatory and Legislative Affairs. Jim is here to make a presentation on behalf of our behalf of our application and will answer any questions you have at close. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brink. Jim. Mr. Campbell, please welcome. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, thank you so much. Uh, as Dwayne said, my name is Jim Campbell, the regional vice president for regulatory, regulatory and legislative affairs. Um, I think Dwayne said it best. I, I want to thank staff as well for all the hard work we've done. Uh, although we filed a month ago, this work has been going on for months now, uh, and their diligence and their efforts have been um, much appreciated. Uh, I think Dwayne said it clearly. I, our, our application speaks for itself. I certainly don't want to repeat that. Uh, we definitely stand ready to bring the benefits of competition to res residents of Minnesota. And I'm sure you'll find that we meet the qualifications of uh, the legal and technical and financial qualifications to provide this product. You know, Mr. Bradley said it best. It, this is a unique process, uh, and that's kind of too bad. Uh, 36 years ago, the original franchise was granted, and 23 years ago, the FCC eliminated exclusive franchises. Yet here we are in 2015, and there's nobody else competing in the cable world. Uh, that's too bad for residents of Minnesota. Um, you know, the benefits of competition clearly show that consumers win when you have facilities-based competition. And the FCC studies have shown 
is that incumbent cable operators gen generally behave better when there's another wire line provider. Uh, and we've seen that in other markets where we've launched PRISM, that the, the incumbent operator has actually reacted very well, uh, and it's the residents who win. Uh, but it's too bad we haven't had that here in Minnesota. Compare that to other industries. Uh, you look at the Internet, which uh, up until this Thursday has been unregulated. I think the FCC is coming out with an order Thursday. We'll see what that says. But the Internet has exploded without any regulation. Uh, you probably have 40 or 50 providers here uh, in the Twin Cities providing Internet service. You look at telecommunications. Our original industry where we too were the incumbent monopoly, uh, they broke our networks up and, and made them available to competitors in 1996. Uh, the competitors had no ubiquitous build requirements and we are, now are down to 24% market share. And I would imagine that the incumbent cable operator is actually a bigger voice provider here in Minneapolis than we are. And again, that's without any ubiquitous build requirements. And here we sit in, again in 2015 and there's no competitor that's bringing those benefits to residents of Minneapolis. So the issue of the day here, and once we get through the application, you peel the onion away, is in fact uh, the build-out requirement in state law that Mr. Bradley mentioned. Little bit of history. Um, as you know, in 2003, 2004 timeframe, AT&T was working across its territory uh, seeking state legislative relief in removing franchising authority from local government up to the state state governments. And they were six, uh, probably 27 states do that currently. That's not the case here in Minnesota. As, as Mr. Bradley said, you still are the stewards of the market for the video in the video marketplace. But the FCC looked at competition where there were statewide franchising and versus those where there was still local regulation. And they became a little bit concerned that competition was not flourishing in markets like Minneapolis, like Denver, where the local market still held the, the regulatory control. So they kind of took a look at that and said, you know, why is that? And the first issue they found was the timing. Um, the, the state franchises, you get a little bit quicker. It takes a little bit longer at the local level. And the other thing they found was that a lot of times the local government, at the behest of the incumbent, was requiring a full build-out requirement. And they said, you know, that, that just seems to be a barrier to entry because no second entrant would ever agree to that. Uh, and so they came out with an order in 2007 it basically said, we're not going to touch the state laws in those states that, that have statewide franchising, but we want to provide local government some guidelines as to what is and is not a barrier to entry. And one of the things they found was requiring a ubiquitous build within a short period of time is, in fact, a barrier to entry for a second entrant. I think the facts prove it out here uh, in Minneapolis because there is no second entrant. I'd like to quote from the FCC, if I may, please excuse my glasses. Uh, they said in their order, uh, because a second provider realistically cannot count on acquiring a share of the market similar to the incumbent share, the second entrant cannot justify a large initial deployment. Rather, a new entrant must begin offering service within a smaller area to determine whether it can reasonably ensure return on its investment before expanding. I think what they were saying there is that if a local government requires a ubiquitous coverage requirement within a certain time frame, that's a barrier to entry for a second entrant. Here's where the, the issue gets a little bit interesting. Minnesota has a state law, as Mr. Bradley said, 23084, that requires a five-year bill. Now, that law was lobbied for and advocated by the incumbent cable operator, probably for the very reason the FCC <laughs> was, very problem the FCC was trying to avoid. There is a footnote in the FCC order which states, this order, the one I just quoted you from, does not apply to state law, any state laws that are in existence today. This, if you look at the legislative intent, what they were trying to do was not touch those states that had very, that had passed state laws for statewide franchising in those recent years because there really wasn't a record on how competition was flourishing. It was designed uh, to require, or the prohibition was directed at local governments and the footnote exempted the state laws. It did not, in our minds, exempt a state law that requires a local government to act. Now, the state law in Minnesota is unique. I've never seen it in any other state. It's not a statewide franchising statute. It's a state law that requires local governments to act. So the FCC, in their order, stated that the barrier to entry of ubiquitous build that's exactly what they were trying to prevent. And so a state law that requires local government to include that in their franchise would be covered under a preemption of this order. And that's why it's, it's CenturyLink's position that this, uh, the state law in Minnesota has in fact been preempted. Um, 
I, uh, again, we look forward to bringing the benefits of competition here. You don't have anybody else knocking on your door. You probably won't. Uh, and I think it's the residents of Minnesota who will win at the end of the day. Uh, if I could note another thing, Mr. Chairman, uh, we did review a letter submitted by Comcast uh, in the record today. In this letter, there is a uh, pretty overt suggestion that CenturyLink has somehow discriminated uh, in its deployment in Phoenix. I reviewed our uh, current deployment as of last night in Phoenix, and I think that the record would clearly indicate that the, uh, the allegations made by Comcast are not only wrong, but dead wrong. Uh, so uh, I, I understand Comcast tactics. They're going to throw enough grenades into this process to see what explodes uh, in the hope that they can impede or as delay as long as possible our entry into the market. You know, I, I get that. We played this game in, in many other markets. It's an interesting tactic uh, given the fact that they're on their way out of this market. But I would make a request of this committee, two requests. One, uh, that if Comcast speaks today at this hearing, that you ask them to provide a shred of evidence that we have ever discriminated, because this is a quasi-judicial hearing, and, and bringing that allegation is irresponsible at best and probably fraudulent. Uh, and two, and we've dealt with them in many other markets, so I assume you'll get no evidence. Uh, if that's the case, then I would ask that they formally retract that statement from the record and issue a public apology. So with that, I stand to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Campbell. Um, before we get into hearing from others, <coughs> we'll invite uh, council members to ask any questions of staff or uh, CenturyLink. So, Council Vice President Glidden, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, and, and I had wondered how you wanted to, to handle this because I do have um, some questions. And I also, um, one of our colleagues um, who is on this committee was unable to attend because he is ill and he also submitted some questions and I or I'm sure others are happy to help ask those. So um, let me first ask this question. Um, I will say that um, um, it's really interesting to hear the data about how long it's been since there's been an applicant, second applicant since the 1970s. So that certainly says something, I guess, about the, the, the framework um, for allowing that competition. And I personally am really excited about the opportunity for competition. Um, but there are some items in your application where I was confused on where inform why information wasn't provided. One of the most basic questions I guess I'll ask is, um, and it is in the follow-up uh, questions that were submitted to CenturyLink, um, there is a question about your, where would be your kind of first line of coverage. And there's some uh, information where you say you would cover 30% of the city once a uh, franchise was awarded, but you have not provided any map, you have not provided any general description of where that coverage would be, and I would like to understand why not, and I would like to see that information. Uh, Councilwoman, that's perfectly acceptable. We actually do have maps showing our initial coverage. Uh, we've showed them. I think a, a couple members of council have seen them. We would be happy to meet with all of you and show you what that looks like. Uh, the reason it's not included here is because uh, it's, it's competitively sensitive information. Obviously, our competitive Competitors would love to get their hands on that map, but we would be happy to show you ward by ward uh, our deployment, uh, the initial coverage deployment. Uh, it, it, we'd be happy to meet with you and do that. Okay. And, well, I guess I will say I, I appreciate that offer. Um, because we are in this quasi-judicial mm -hmm. context, I'm not sure exactly how that works, and I think part of the um, concern, too, is that not only... Um, council members can review the information, but our staff and others, whether, because I know there is a mechanism where sometimes you submit information but identify that it is confidential so that our lawyers and others can review it, or there, I guess, is a question too whether it really should have that um, um, classification as confidential. Um, I guess you're not even, you're saying it's beyond trade secret. It's, it's uh, something beyond trade secret. So, so that's where I, I feel like we're in a bit of a conundrum here. Um, and I 
I guess I'll ask the advice of, of our lawyers after this hearing whether I can see that information at this point in time. I just want to be careful again because we're in this quasi-judicial context. But I'll say that it's a concern um, that that information isn't submitted. Um, a second question that I had was about um, your... Um, uh, designs for building out beyond uh, 30%. And I do understand, um, probably you want to repeat this in your answer, uh, that you, um, there is a dispute here with um, questions of preemption and you talked about this ubiquitous uh, requirement for building out within a certain time frame, but even like taking that out of mix. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> I mean, we don't have an understanding of what would be your goals to build out through the city or, or how the city would be better covered. Sure. So can you tell us a little bit more about that answer and what are your plans? Sure. So absolutely. Um, the FCC, when they came out with their order, did say that while a ubiquitous coverage requirement is a barrier to entry, um, if you had an initial minimum requirement with further expansion tied to success, that is a reasonable approach, and that's the approach we're taking here. So we would have a provision in the franchise that says at a, uh, at a minimum within two years of the agreement, three years of the agreement, CenturyLink will cover a percentage of the city, and we'll negotiate what that percentage is. We'll probably go way past it, uh, and I'll explain that in my answer as well. But uh, then we would take a snapshot of what that coverage looks like on the third anniversary. So I'm just going to use flat numbers here. Let's say we passed 50,000 homes on year three. The agreement would say that we don't have to expand until we hit, and the number we've used in other markets, and we'd probably use it here, is 27.5% market penetration. So once 27.5% of those folks actually call us and sign up for our service, we would be required to uh, expand our network to an additional percentage of the city. Then we would take another snapshot and repeat that process until we built out to the entire city. So what our agreement is a market success-based model. What you're saying is, okay, as a second entrant, we, we realize you can't go everywhere on day one, but as you're successful, you should be required to keep moving. And that's the approach we've taken in 50 other cities, and the one we would take here as well. So I'm a little bit confused, though, okay. because this is the application, you know, opportunity right. for you, and it seems like this would be the instance when you would let us know if, if that's sort of putting your best foot forward, what would that look like? So say, uh, you know, you have some model that you've used in other cities sure. where you have a, a way that you're then able to, I guess, finance more build out by getting certain market penetration. I guess that's kind of the theory. Um, but why wouldn't you tell us more about that here? Um, because we, you know, at this point, uh, there's nothing that helps us understand what would be the commitment of CenturyLink to, to serve the city of Minneapolis. Sure. Councilwoman, we, we've had those discussions with staff uh, and as we've moved to this proceeding, you know, the, the, we were advised the purpose of this proceeding is basically to, to decide the application and whether we're technically legal and financially qualified. I can tell you what we've done in other markets. Um, for example, in South Denver, we've agreed in seven franchises to cover a minimum of 15% of the city within three years. And then we would expand on that as we hit 27.5% market share. Let me tell you what we've actually done in those cities. Uh, even though we agreed to a minimum coverage of 15%, the lowest percentage we cover is 60% uh, after eight months. In Omaha, we agreed to cover a minimum of 25%, which is a little different franchise because one franchise covers most of the market. After two years, we're at 53%. In Colorado Springs, we agreed to an initial coverage of 20%. After 18 months, we're at about 62%. So in all of these cities, we've gone well past our initial commitment. 
What we can't do is we've set that commitment pretty standard across the board, that percentage, and because we have to deal with, we have three, 400 of these things to get in the markets we're trying to deploy, these franchise agreements. So as you know, uh, cities all talk and they, they know what other cities have agreed to. So if you agree to a little something more here, it kind of stair steps, stair steps its way up as you move across the board. But our track record has clearly indicated we have gone well past what we've committed to. And that's the same here in Minnesota, or Minneapolis. Right, and, and that's helpful. I mean, I think that speaks to um, just your past history as a company and how you commit to an area, but we're sort of in this framework, and I, I understand you kind of disagree with kind of this, again, this preemption issue, but uh, as I understand it, under Minnesota law, there is this requirement for getting some, I'm looking for the language right now, but the uh, information that tells us how you are planning to expand in, in the market. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I'm having a little bit of a challenge because we don't have the map showing the 30% coverage and, and, and then have that understanding of how you would progress past then. Um, so I, I just want to kind of put that out there. And again, this is opportunity for you to kind of think about what additional information you want to submit into the public record that supports your case. I just am really want to put this out there as an opportunity uh, for you to be considering uh, and how we're trying to understand and consider our obligations under state law as well. Um, I wanted to uh, maybe read some of these questions from my colleague, uh, Councilmember Andrew Johnson, sure. who wasn't able to join us today um, because he had some pretty particular <laughs> uh, questions. And uh, so if, if I may, Mr. I Mr. Chair, um, let's see. Uh, he says that on page uh, 18 of your response, uh, item number 28, uh, uh, it says, uh, he is saying CenturyLink says that the initial deployment will be to 30% of households in Minneapolis. How much of the initial deployment will actually be fiber to the home versus existing DSL to the home? In other words, are they actually investing heavily in building out new infrastructure as is marketed by running highly coveted fiber to many homes or is primar or primarily uh, flipping, flipping the switch is what he says on existing infrastructure to turn on TV access and perhaps running fiber to nodes that don't already have it. Does that okay. make sense? That does make sense. I'll see if I can answer it. Uh, I think the answer to all the questions is yes, um, other than the fact that it, it really isn't uh, flipping a switch. We will be deploying video services heavily via fiber to the home uh, in the first deployment, but we also have what's called fiber to the node, and I think that's what he referred to as DSL deployment that we will be investing in as well. That's where you can get speeds up to 40 meg over the copper wires uh, if you live within 4,000 feet. That is another method by which we will do that. Um, so we will be deploying substantially using both of those technologies, uh, but the initial deployment is lar the, what we're working on now and the gigabit announcement is largely fiber to the home. And then he has another question that says on page 12 of your response, which I guess is also uh, response number 12, uh, says that there will be, you say that there will be no difference in quality of the video from customer to customer. Um, could you please describe how this is the case when providing IP television access uh, tel IP television across two different networks, network infrastructures to the home Fiber and DSL. I apologize. I'm not. That's <laughs> I'm all right. No. Um, so you need to have a minimum of about 25 megabits of speed to to be able to provide full HD quality video signal. Uh, since our both our fiber to the node and our fiber to the home gets us well above that, there is no difference to either customer as to what our video product looked like. It's a it's a fully digital product. Um, so there's enough, enough bandwidth using both of those technologies that it's seamless to the customer. They won't know whether they're uh, fiber to the home or fiber to the node. The biggest issue there is, is internet speeds, but at a minimum, the internet speeds will be 25 meg up to a gig. So plenty of bandwidth. I think, does that answer the question? I think so. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure there's going to be okay. more opportunities. One of the other uh, things before I 
uh, invite uh, Councilmember Yang to ask his question. Um, are there other cities in the state of Minnesota that are using uh, the PRISM system? No, not currently there are no, we have no other franchises in the Twin Cities area. We're working with uh, cable commissions in the Twin Cities across the metro area to try and get the same authority to go in and, and compete. Right, uh, and as, as we're considering the build out issues within the city of Minneapolis, obviously Minneapolis is not the only city that you seek to do business in, mm -hmm. will include St. Paul, mm -hmm. uh, but all the neighboring communities. As you seek individual franchises with those other neighboring communities, would we uh, be granting our uh, franchise authority, for example, uh, if that were to come to pass it's in Minneapolis at the expense of, say, Richfield asks you to do the same thing, would their deployment build out be in conflict with each other? Or no. Would it have to be no, we're, we're seeking all these franchises at the same time. You know, the, our investment, as Dwayne said, is, is metro wide. Um, and I would point out, Mr. Chair, that there are, you know, the city of Owatonna granted a competitive franchise that did not require build out. Uh, I think the company was called Jaguar. So there is precedence in Minnesota where oh, other okay. cities have you know, said. I, I thought that there was other yes. cities, but they weren't CenturyLink. Uh, That's correct. There are, there are other cities that have said, we, we don't think that, in fact, Owatonna City, the, when they, they, the city council uh, deliberated, I believe they actually quoted the FCC order and said, you know, that's a barrier to entry. So there's a, there are other franchises where other cities have said, we, we don't think the state law applies anymore. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Yang, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to thank um, Council Vice President uh, Glidden for actually asking uh, the questions from Council Member Johnson because it was all like French to me. I just didn't understand most of it. So <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I hope I have a simpler question, but um, I'm going to try to ask it maybe in two different ways. And, um, you know, Mr. Campbell, you talked about build out in uh, different cities that um, CenturyLink has been in. And, you know, the build out has started small, but I mean, you know, in a year or two, I mean, it expanded quite a bit. And, you know, um, I wanted to ask with regards to those specific cities, um, I, I don't really care necessarily about, um, I guess, the expansion of the build out. I'm just wondering the, the parts that were not built out. I mean, what made CenturyLink decide not to build out uh, or what made it put it as a, a lack of priori prioritization with regards to the parts that weren't built out. Um, you know, how do you guys make that decision? Obviously, did, did that uh, make sense? It does make sense. Okay. And, and you know, you're going to hear a lot of things like redlining and cherry picking. I, I get all that. It's, you know, that's, that's this incumbent's, incumbent's tactic to do that. And it's, you know, it's, it's an argument that's complete without merit. Redlining is, is illegal. Um, but we actually, when we look at that, we look at A, where it's probably cheapest to get the network distributed. You know, certain areas are gonna be more expensive th than others, whether it's how far they are from the central office, uh, how many nodes might be in a given area. So the first thing we're gonna look at is where can we spend the, the most to get to the most people? Um, obviously, that, that's your initial deployment. And then, you know, you're gonna look at things like uh, density. Um, obviously, video service is a lot better in, in dense markets uh, where there's a lot of homes served. Each one of these nodes can serve four to 500 homes and where you get a lot of them, that's the best bang for your buck. Uh, ironically, this, this gig deployment is going to areas that are closest to the central office. So our fiber to the home deployment is actually gonna start initially in the areas that were bypassed uh, in the earlier generations of internet. And so it's the, the, you know, the areas that are closer to downtown. That's, that's you know, one of the areas we're looking at to go to first. Uh, so those are the factors that, that come into it. Does that okay. answer your question? Yeah, kind of. Sure. Um, let me let me expand on that. Um, sure. So, I mean, using what you just uh, described there, I mean, basically, areas that are closer to downtown probably will, you know, get built out. Um, even if they don't get built out, let's say within the first thirty percent, I mean, uh, shortly thereafter, I mean, it's likely that they'll get built out, uh, assuming density and those sorts of things. Whereas, you know, let's say you know a place that uh, has less density, such as you know a place that, let's say, has just only a few homes here and there, you know, spread across maybe a certain area. I mean, that's going to um, be kind of on the back burner. Right? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, that's right. I mean, if, if you're going to spend $1,000, you'd rather hit 1,000 homes than 10. Right. Um, but it, w it won't be on the back burner. Right. Uh, it'll be, uh, as we're successful, we will expand. And in the markets we've launched, we've done very well within two to three years of getting some good penetration uh, into these markets. 
Okay, and Mr. Campbell, with regards to, I mean, I imagine getting into the cable business here uh, in the city of Minneapolis, I imagine, I mean, you guys need to do, um, let's say, different customer service centers and those sorts of things. I mean, what's what's the plan with regards to that, if that were to be the case? Or, you know, uh, are you just going to use existing downtown buildings that you guys have in terms of, you know, reaching out to your future customers? As far, I mean, as far as selling? Right. Well, you know, yes, we're, we're going to use our existing facilities. We have, you know, centers here in the Minneapolis area that we currently sell our other products, our uh, broadband and, and voice products. So we're just going to add the video product to that bundle. Uh, and, it, you know, it's incumbent upon us to do the best job we can to sell it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Not seeing any other questions at the moment, so I want to give you a chance to rest and get ready for the next round. All right, get another sip of water. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're going to be able to continue the, the public hearing portion of the meeting, and I think I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Long. I don't know if you'd like to make any uh, remarks. Uh, Comcast has uh, certainly submitted a, uh, a letter of comment, um, and I wondered if you wanted to highlight some of that for uh, the committee members and the public. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Uh, my name is Mike Logan with Comcast. Um, no, I don't think I will take the opportunity to highlight much of the letter other than to say that we've submitted it. Comcast is very proud to serve the entire city of Minneapolis and um, would expect and hope that for purposes of both competitive equity as within our franchise as well as for community equity in terms of access to the products that my colleagues from Centralic mentioned, um, not to mention in accordance with the FCC rulings as we see them, both the 621 order and those of the past, as well as uh, state law, that you would, would look at any new franchise entrant, competition that we welcome openly and excitingly, uh, as it will create a dynamic market here in the Twin Cities and in Minneapolis. But we'd hope that you you look at those considerations as you take this under uh, advisement. Um, and that's all. If we can be of additional information or service, our doors are always open and we're happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Okay, we're going to be able to continue uh, any other public uh, comments. I know uh, we've had one person sign up. It's Mr. Rhodes. If there's anybody else that would wish to uh, uh, sign up, you could notify the clerk or just raise your hand. But uh, Mr. Uh, Pete Rhodes. Good afternoon, committee, esteemed members. My name is Pete Rhodes. I live at 2214 Blaisdell Avenue in Minneapolis. I'm here today not to object to the competition, but to request fair and equitable distribution of any new cable franchise granted in Minneapolis as required by state statute 23.08 subdivision 1B of the franchise requirement at this point. I believe adherence to these conditions are important for the communities I serve and to my company and for cable franchise licenses granted in Minneapolis. My company BMA for a little background is a pioneer in delivering cultural specific music entertainment, local news, exclusive features through partnerships with our minority media partners, businesses, civic, social and religious organizations since 1984. We were around at the time of the initial uh, cable franchise agreement and a lot of your previous colleagues over a generation ago for some of you were here and I stood in front of them and presented my need and my offer to provide this most important service. Our 24 hour cable channel is distributed currently on Comcast channel 937 reaching all 500,000 subscribers through their entire service footprint. Today, in terms of this demographic that I serve, 65% of African Americans and other diverse community television viewing is spent on cable. As the gentleman pointed out earlier, this is a very valuable privilege. Also, African-Americans deliver about 20% of all cable viewing in prime time. So they use the services of cable systems uh, more than any given ethnic group uh, in, in, in viewing on, on uh, options uh, for cable. This is my audience. 
And if any new cable franchise is not mandated to cover the entire market, it places an economic disadvantage to my community and the service I provide. Unfair and equitable service distribution as a prescribed in the state statute impacts already underserved, and if they don't do that, <clears throat> it'll impact uh, already underserved communities against competitive price opportunities, broadband services, cultural specific programming, and it would also have the potential of taking away audiences developed over the years, hard fought at my ad by my company, BMA Networks. In closing, I want to submit a letter from one of our partners, Pastor Billy G. Russell, the president of the 10,000 member Minnesota Baptist Convention. Finally, I would like to support cable competition. I want that to be known. It's good for our consumers and for the minority communities as long as it provides minority business and programming opportunities and a fair and equitable distribution of services as required. I'll enter that letter uh, into uh, uh, with the clerk and I'm available for any questions in regards to my service and, and how I feel moving forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Rhodes, for your comments. Is there additional comments from the public? Is there anyone? There's one there. Sorry. Go ahead and come on up. Uh, why don't you, if you could, uh, stand right behind the, the next person and we can keep the queue moving. But if you could introduce yourself with your name and address and appreciate your comments. <laughs> including the runaway. I'm Amanda Axvig, and Molly's my runaway over there. I live at 2016th Avenue in Northeast, and I am a small business owner who works out of my home with childcare four days of the week. <laughs> you can figure out which one I don't. Um, but anyway, my main concern is that I just want to make sure that it's, you know, on record the importance of making sure that all these service providers are playing, on this, playing by the same rules. And the 30% um, just doesn't seem acceptable because we don't know, you know, where that rollout's going to take place. This is rumor mill, of course, but I have heard that's not going to be in my area. Obviously, I can't confirm that. Um, but I just can't imagine seeing my rates jumping up for an, you know, unknown amount of time because, you know, it's just that 30%. Where is that going to be? Um, so I just wanted to make a brief statement saying that I feel that proposing that reach is not acceptable. Thank you very much for your comment. Sir, again, your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Warder. I live in Midtown uh, Phillips neighborhood. Uh, I have a question, but I think most of the question I have, uh, City Council uh, Elizabeth Gilden has asked, mm -hmm. so I don't have to repeat a lot. We just have a same question about uh, and same rules apply to everybody, and we are concerned about the 30% services, and we would like all the city neighborhoods to be served equally and fairly, and I, all that I have to say. I have a letter to give to the uh, city clerks later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wardier. I just wanted to highlight, we, we do have your letter, I believe. So yeah, you have that letter. That's one of them, but I have another one now. An additional right. one. Thank you. Yes. We well, would be sure to include Thank that you. additional letter as part of the record as well. I also want to note we received a, a letter of support uh, from the Communication Workers of America, and uh, that letter is also part of our public record. Is there anybody else that would wish to contribute, comment? Anyone? Anyone? Well, thank you. I'm going to give Mr. Lively the last word. That catches you off guard, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can. Excuse me, Mr. Lively, while you prepare your thoughts for a question yet answered or asked, uh, Council Vice President had a comment. I just had a question probably for Mr. Bradley um, because there was this case from Owatonna that was cited in the materials and um, I take it that is not CenturyLink because they said they haven't entered uh, Minnesota markets mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to know if you could give us a little, since that case was in there, a little background. That's a very recent case that I assume may be also being appealed. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Member uh, Glidden. It's um, calling it a case. It really, it really isn't a case. Okay. It's, it's a situation that um, that Owatonna was in. The city of Owatonna made a decision to uh, grant a cable franchise to a company called Jaguar Communications. Um, the incumbent cable operator, if I'm not mistaken, is Charter uh, in that um, community. Um, my understanding in that community is that the cable franchise with Charter um, or the incumbent cable franchise operator, whether it was Charter or Mediacom, I can't remember which one it was, um, had expired. Um, but they, uh, they did agree to a, a new cable franchise with, um, with Jaguar. Uh, it's my understanding that the cable franchise uh, did not contain the exact build out language that I mentioned in my presentation about a five year uh, mandatory build. It contained language that um, had a you know, required build out to a portion of the city and then once penetrations rates hit, I think 49% in that area that, that they would agree to build to other areas of the city. But it's my understanding that that decision was not appealed and I believe the appeal time has now run, but it was done you know, fairly recently within the last three months. Thank you, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lively, my... Uh, Closing uh, question was about um, Minneapolis channels, our nine channels, uh, MTN, and the what's in it to the for the city of Minneapolis. Beyond the franchise fees themselves, what are we talking about in terms of PEG and some of the other things? Uh, Chair Quincy, anything that would be written into a second franchise with within Minneapolis with any cable company would include the same provisions around public education, government, television as we have with the incumbent provider. Does that answer your question? It does. I okay. just wanted to, you could highlight, I think we have nine channels available sure. and that would be included in any sure. subsequent. Chair Quincy, that's correct. We do have nine channels, three of which we currently use for city government purposes. Uh, and then there are also channels available for public access, which is MTN uh, and the schools as well. So those are things that we would receive uh, in a, any cable franchise, uh, regardless of who that operator was. Uh, there would be uh, PEG fees, which are public education government fees, which are paid on a per subscriber basis monthly. That would also uh, be common to any cable provider that we had in the city, uh, as well as, as we've talked about, franchise fees, which are for the use of the right of way. Thank you very much. So with that, I think I'm going to close the uh, public hearing portion of this uh, issue um, with the understanding that uh, written comments and uh, questions are still welcome through the end of Friday, uh, February 27th at 5 p.m. and that will be the official close of the public hearing. But so can we get on for the rest of our day? I'm gonna to have to close today's meeting, but th thank everybody for their work on this issue, the application and from the comments from the public. And we look forward to the next round of uh, uh, response on the status of the application and as a recommendation to this uh, committee and to the full city council. So with that, we'll receive and file this uh, presentation. All those in favor of that, please say aye. Aye. And that passes, and uh, we are adjourned for the day as we've concluded our business. Thank you. <laughs>